Hello and a warm welcome to everybody, especially here to our audience who has made the way here to the beautiful Harbour City in Hamburg. But also a warm welcome and hello in Moli Mumia, how they say it in Uganda, or almost like this, I think. All of you from wherever, whatever corner in the world you watching us today. If you want to go far, go alone. If you want to, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. This normally is considered to be an African proverb, even though some people do doubt the origin uh, being African of this proverb. But that doesn't matter because the, the message is universal, meaning that uh, cooperation, collaboration can very often lead us much further uh, as if we would go alone, even though it's of course more complex and uh, we might advance a bit more slowly. And today we want to shed a light, especially on this, on uh, this very particular, very special form of collaboration, which are the so-called multi-stakeholder partnerships in general. And the people, uh, the people of Uganda and the project of the Team Up Uganda in particular. Team Up Uganda, this uh, development initiative, aims at importing, Im improving the lives of young people aged between 15 and 30 in the district of Mityana, which is very close to Uganda's capital, Kampala. And we can really say that Team Up is fairly complex. It was initiated, initiated by the German Ministry of Econo Economic Cooperation and Development, the BMZ. It is co-financed through three foundations, the Deutsche Stiftung Weltbevölkerung, the Hans A. Neumann Foundation and the Siemens Foundation. It unites three local organizations, Action for Health, the Hans R. Neumann Stiftung Africa and WAVE Solutions in Uganda on the field. And on top of all that, it has a cross and multi-sectoral approach, which means it is dedicated to agriculture, health, as well as water and san sanitation. So now we want to discuss today how can such an extensive effort be designed implemented and managed so that the journey towards a better life is as fast as possible, but also leads us as far as possible at the same time. My name is Monika Högen and I'm very honored to lead through that discussion today. And I'm here with my distinguished guests. And I first would like to very, very warmly welcome you as well. Monika Basemera, Team Up Uganda, very welcome. Susanne Salz from the Deutsche Gesellschaft for International Zusammenarbeit, the GIZ, the German International Cooperation Agency, and Leona Henry, you are a senior research associate on, from the University of Witten Herdecke here in Germany. So welcome to all three and maybe a warm applause for us to start the discussion. So Monika, I would like to start with you because you have the the broadest knowledge of what is going on with Team Up Uganda. You are the head of prog the program coordination unit in Uganda. You hold a master's of research in politics. You also have a master's, in, a master's of art in international relations and a master's of art in development studies. Um, when we go through your CV, all your main tasks, that already sounds very complex, monitoring, collaboration, communication, stakeholder manage management, just to name a few of your main tasks within this project. You also work extensively with the district teams, so you really know what's going on on the ground. And you have one life mission, which is you want to empower the youth. Uh, so for us, in order to understand the situation on the ground a little bit, could you just give us a very brief description on what, uh, what are the conditions for the young people in Uganda in that district? Um, thank you for having me. Um, in Mitiana, um, in the rural areas of, of Mitiana where we're working, um, the initial situation before we started was that uh, young girls were walking mal uh, long distances um, to fetch water and many cases were subject to abuse when they were there. The water sources in their communities were not functioning. We had a high prevalence of HIV and also young people were not engaged in income generating activities like agriculture that were important to making sure that they had 
money in their pocket to access services within their communities. Um, we also had a lack of access and information to um, sexual reproductive health and commodities, um, and also uh, especially because we wanted to make sure that they were youth friendly and, and age appropriate. So the multi-sector uh, um, uh, um, partnerships uh, sought to um, unify these needs and address them mm -hmm. to not only look at one particular uh, um, need and requirement in the young people's lives uh, in Mitiana, but to look at them as a whole and as a unit and to do this together. Mm -hmm. yes. Before we uh, come a bit more in detail to that, um, the proximity between Mitiana district and uh, the capital Kampala, does that also have an effect? Yes, on, uh, because of that proximity, we, we experienced a lot of uh, rural um, to urban migration, which was creating, um, 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 first of all, a dearth, a uh, um, lack of uh, young people who are very vibrant um, to improve the communities where they lived, but also a strain on the urban areas to try to provide services and, and, and the, the right structures within those, those parameters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, as you said, the multi-sectoral and multi-stakeholder approach wants to also unify a lot of things. And as I can imagine, NGOs might have been working with the youth in that area long before Team Up Uganda came into the picture. So could you maybe give some main, main points with what is the main difference between your work and that uh, of when, when at the time when NGOs or whoever were trying to do it alone? Um, first and foremost, uh, the uniqueness about it is that uh, it started right from the field. We were trying to create structures and um, um, young people uh, to empower them to actually change their communities in these multi-sectoral partnerships. But also we were engaging them with the districts so that we were not just working um, the CSOs coming in and saying, you know, uh, we're going to change your lives, but empowering them to change their lives, connecting them with the local government and the districts, and then also trying to look at um, other private partnerships like um, Opportunity Bank that created uh, um, financial packages for young people. And then right then at the top, the partnerships between the CSOs, which were, um, as you mentioned earlier, were working, had expertise, technical expertise in agriculture for HR and specifically for, uh, Action for Health, we had the health component in SRHR, and then WAVE, the preventive maintenance approach that was so important. And then going to the German, um, the German group, you had the foundations that came together and pooled resources supported by the, um, the German government. So that uniqueness of trying to move right from the field level, integrating the local government, getting the field level and the young people to also integrate um, their structures, moving it to district, moving it to us, the CSOs, and then getting the foundations to also understand that concept that was the unique bit that created those linkages right from the field yeah. into the, the, the donor, donor, donor uh, world. Yeah, mm -hmm. and from what I understand, there are also uh, really some important synergy effects for the organizations themselves. You have a joint office, if I'm not yes, mistaken. We do have a joint office and that, um, first of all, creates efficiency because you can just walk to the door next to talk to you to, to the other partner, but also it creates a kind of a, um, effective and cost-effective use of funds, yeah. So you're not spending um, a lot of money to have three separate offices. You have one office, you can talk to each other. If you're going to the field, you can go together. If you have an activity with a district, you can do it jointly. You're not having engaging the district three times. If you have uh, um, a workshop with the youth, it's only one. You're not having three different mm -hmm. workshops. So cost-effective, um, um, efficient in the way we are doing it, yes. And do you also think that your voice is more hurt on a district level because you're raising it together? Yes, um, those synergies mean that um, you are giving um, the district um, value. Mm -hmm. You know, you are um, ensuring that uh, many of the needs that they want to address but in many cases are not able either through uh, lack of funding, lack of personnel, you're trying to bridge those gaps with mm -hmm. them, you know? Um, so, and also, um, for example, if HRNS, has, uh, HRNS at the time was working in Mitiana and also Action for Health, so they know you, you know? When they have issues maybe with engaging and wanting to work with young people, the groups that you formulate in the communities are groups that they can work with effectively mm -hmm. and efficiently. So those groups can actually access 
you know, government programs and, and things that before they wouldn't they wouldn't be able to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yes, there's the value and connection with the districts and synergies that are so important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. We will come up to, uh, come back to Team Up Uganda a bit later. First of all, I want to address Leona Henry right uh, next to me. Uh, you hold a PhD, sorry, at the University in Herdecker, Witten Herdecker, right. here in Germany. You're a senior research associate um, at the Reinhard Mohn Institute of Management, which okay. also belongs to the, or is attached to the university. Exactly. And you specialized in the concept of such multi-stakeholder approaches and networks as the one we just heard about, and especially um, in sustainable development. And that's also uh, the focus of a recent study that you did. Um, you re did research on how organization coordin coordination of such partnership works. Uh, so maybe you can just uh, tell us a little bit about how you how you did the study and what were some main findings? Sure, yeah. First of all, thank you so much for the introduction and for inviting me. Um, yeah, so I indeed uh, met Team Up, so to speak, in the context of this study that you already mentioned, which um, I conducted about a year ago, and it was uh, really sp specifically about the resilience of multi-stakeholder partnerships. Um, and I was interested in understanding there how these partnerships adapt in very let's say, disruptive and turbulent times like the outbreak of a global pandemic. And um, Team Up indeed was one of the partnerships that uh, participated uh, in the study and um, yeah, which I learned also a lot from. So what this study showed um, broadly in terms of resilience of these multi-stakeholder partnerships was that they can indeed be very resilient if they manage to very quickly, together with community members, develop um, innovative and, and I would say entrepreneurial approaches to, um, to community engagement. Uh, for example, by um, mobilizing digital technologies in a new way or also by sort of restructuring themselves in um, a novel, let's say, novel manner. And um, in that sense, I think the main takeaway from this study, uh, without going in <laughs> too much detail, is that um, multi-stakeholder partnerships, they can become very mm -hmm. um, resilient or they can be very resilient. They can also even sort of bounce back stronger than maybe before such mm -hmm. a period of crisis, but only really if the right structures and right, let's say, conditions are already in place before such a period, right? Mm -hmm. and. Um, yeah, this is actually where Team Up was a pretty good example of. That would have been my next yeah. question. If you <laughs> had to assess uh, Team Up Uganda in comparison to the other uh, networks you were looking at, how what 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 note would they get? From uh, you? <laughs> well, I'm not going to attach a score or anything, score, but I it? think it would. Uh, what I observed that was pretty interesting was that. Um, team up developed some of these really innovative ways of um, basically responding to, to the pandemic outbreak. In my opinion, for example, the the phone farming example, I think, is very uh, helpful in this uh, in this context. So where, and Monica can tell much more about this, but where you went out to the field and sort of substituted the normal trainings uh, with WhatsApp phone farming um, trainings. Uh, and this is uh, something that, of course, requires already a very strong connection between local communities, the youth also especially, and um, the partnership uh, before the moment of crisis sort of hits, mm -hmm. right? Because if that's not in place before, then that will not work out so quickly. So in that sense, um, yeah, Team Up was uh, one of the partnerships that, that really came out strongly in terms of building a very resilient structure mm -hmm. in the pandemic crisis. So a good connection with the local community is, is a, f a, key, a key success factor for multi-stakeholder partnerships, I understand, in general? Definitely. I mean, in general, of course, yes. but also it, it showed to be even more important also in these moments of crisis, yes. uh, where really new approaches ha have to be developed very quickly, basically. Um, and then also the what Team Up, of course, has in its mission, but what I think is also not uh, given this really strong integration of local youth, right? So mm -hmm. I think several partnerships try to achieve that, but do not always uh, mm -hmm. get to that stage where it becomes really a co-creative effort. And I think that Team Up is really good at mm -hmm. really putting that into practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, we will, of course, come to the obstacles and challenges later as well. But uh, before we do so, I just um, could we, could you name one or two uh, other key success factors for such not only for team up, but uh, but also for multi stakeholder partnerships in general. Um, well, I think it's always important to look at how they are organized. So what I find particularly, um, let's say, critical is to look at what uh, sort of democratic process in the partnership is. So mm -hmm. is it really the case that all stakeholders that are somehow affected uh, by this partnership or by a particular issue really have a say in decision making processes? Do they really get to raise their voice? I think that's one really critical point that should be kept in mind. And then the other one is more a bit of a task related issue, I would say. So mm -hmm. is the partnership really able to address um, the issue that they were set out to address, right? Um, because I feel that even though a lot of partnerships start out with very good intentions and very ambitiously, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, somehow over time, some of them tend to um, stay a bit let's say, I don't want to sound too critical, but merely a place for dialogue. And even if that's a great outcome, maybe in itself already, that's of course not really tackling yeah. an issue. Um, so I think that's, that second point, this more of a self-reflective process, is there really a, a monitoring procedure also in the partnership mm -hmm. uh, is also uh, really important yeah. for a well-functioning one. And also some practicality uh, as well. <laughs> Definitely, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm looking on my left side, uh, Susanne Salz, you, you are also a partnership expert. You are leading the Partnership 2030 team at the GIZ in Germany, the German uh, International uh, Development Cooperation Agency, how we would translate it. Uh, that Partnership 2030 was commissioned by our ex-Minister for Development Cooperation, Gerd Müller, in 2015 to support uh, one of the Sustainable Development Goals uh, by the United Nations, which is the SDG number 17, which is about um, international partnerships. Um, and you yourself, you have 15 years or even more experience in sustainable development, in global governments. You have been working with the UN SDG Action Campaign and also with the Global City Association, ICLEI. So, yeah, a lot of expertise also from this side. And now, uh, uh, within this role, you are counseling and training uh, people who want to do multi-stakeholder partnerships. You also have on your website, you have tools how to best analyze before going on that um, uh, setup to for that adventure. So could you share some of your main advices that you give to your clients uh, with us? Thank you. First of all, thank you for the invitation and having me. It's been interesting already to listen to my fellow panelists. Um, to answer your question, there are many key points to consider. One is a context analysis. So if there's already a similar partnership, is it really worth starting something new? Mm -hmm. If so, then to analyze the stakeholders. Who should really be at the table for this to be worthwhile? Um, and then at the beginning also to invest some time in getting to know each other, building trust, uh, and later on establishing roles and governance structures, um, setting clear goals together so that everybody's on board and really knows where they want to go. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, for the first phase and then later on, monitoring and evaluation systems already came up. There are many other topics we could mention, but uh, for the beginning, if all that is taken into account, then the partnership is on, a, on yeah. a good way to begin with. Okay, but never just go for it without clear analysis. That's what I understand yes. from you. And uh, we heard already from Leona some of the key success factors that she mentioned. Would you agree what she said that local, and in this case also integrating the youth in a very um, direct way, we heard, on, we heard that it has to be a combination of a theoretical but also hands-on approach. Would you agree to that or have, you have to add, would you like to add something to that? I would totally agree with everything. Um, to mention some additional elements, I think communication and trust is key. And for that, role clarity is key. So if you involve the youth, do they know and do the other stakeholders know what their role is? Do, in, in this case, for example, do the Ugandan and the German stakeholders know what their roles are and how you coordinate with each other? So this clarity and clear communication channels, which again helps the trust, which we find time and again is, is very important for mm -hmm. the success of the partnerships. Yeah. Um, um, there was a conference end of April in Berlin, which was uh, dedicated especially to that topic, um, multi-stakeholder networks. And you have been a part of it, you were, but you were not only a participant, you were also a presenter there. And your topic was how to make the impact of such partnerships visible. 
what did you what can you tell us what you told your audience over there <laughs> Right, we already heard that for partnerships, it's often not so easy to really have impact at, I think you called it the field level. So whatever the partnership is about, wherever in the world they're working, to not merely stay at the dialogue, which can also be valuable, but to really make a difference to people or the environment somewhere in the world in a certain country and topic area. Mm -hmm. um, and to really track that and be able to communicate it to new members, to funders, to the general public, it's very difficult. And the methods that there are for monitoring and evaluation are usually not such a good fit for partnerships. Okay. So we developed something called an impact narrative that mm -hmm. is particularly suited to partnerships. Bit of advertisement, you can find it on www.partnerships2030.org. <laughs> okay. We hope it will be helpful. Please note but there quickly. Are, exactly. Um, but there are also other tools, of course, um, and it helps just from the beginning to be clear, have a theory of change or something, yeah. so you know where you're starting and then to be able to measure how far you've actually come by when, um, and possibly also adjust and, and learn, I think you mentioned. Um, yeah. If something isn't working, then to do it differently in future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you for this. And talking about narratives and learning, of course, we also learn a lot from practical examples. And uh, so I want to come back to you, Monica. Uh, we know that what you're doing can be a game changer of young people's life, especially for those who are working very closely with Team Up. And uh, we do have an example here, which is also an example of how the gender aspect is, is um, brought into the picture, but not only, it also is a, is a general thing. And we would like to uh, give the example of Fatuma. Maybe you just can so say one word uh, <laughs> to Fatuma, who is she and uh, why are we talking about her? Uh, Fatuma is what we call a youth champion in her community, who is also leading in what we, uh, the structure that is called the Youth Empowerment Center. And uh, her example shows how dynamic it is when you hand power and decision making mm -hmm. to young people, especially young girls and women mm -hmm. within a community and the effects and impact that yeah. they bring. And in order not to speak about uh, those young people, but also let them speak uh, for themselves, we would like to sh share a short video with you where you can see Fatuma and how her life has changed with Team Up Uganda. And I would like to uh, our team in the back, our technical support to show us the video, please. Hello everyone, I'm Shivan. Two years ago, I embarked on a fun journey following the amazing youth under the Team Up program in Mitiana. Join me today as we head back to see Razak and Fatuma and find out how their lives have been. The Youth Empowerment Center, I was a treasurer, but due to that passion of health, in the community, I had to take up the role of being the advocacy stroke SRH coordinator. Personally, I advocated for integration of uh, family planning and those other youth related issues in outreaches of immunization. So, through the team up, we have been the people implementing at the grassroots. I do sit and I see my achievements come because of what I've done in the health department and my interventions at district level. My life has changed. My capacity has improved. You think beyond yourself. Owning this piece of land makes me so, so motivated and so excited and happy and loving the work I do for young people. So I know there is something I do to, uh, to improve on my well-being and my income as, as well as my family's life. I believe what Team Up has done for me as an individual is shared or I'm sharing it currently with the community, not benefiting me as a mother, but also as a community where I stay as you say. Yeah, that's really impressive when we see here, uh, see her. And, and you told me in advance, you told me that she was very shy at the beginning when she was. Yes, um, she was very um, shy and very withdrawn. But uh, after attending a lot of uh, meetings and mentorships and being put in the position, um, the interesting thing at the YEC, uh, they put her, uh, they, she was a treasurer and she came in as a youth champion in, in the agriculture aspect. And once she got to the um, Youth Empowerment Center, which was in proximity to the Youth Friendly Ce um, Center, she got very interested in sexual reproductive health. Mm -hmm. And then she, um, she 
got integrated into the health center and that's where the multi partnerships mm -hmm. come in because you're not giving them just a world of one of one particular sector you're introducing them to a world of multi of, of multiplicity and they get to choose yeah you know where they fit what they like and 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 and, and yeah she became uh, integrated into the the youth uh, youth uh, youth friendly corner and then started interacting with the district, uh, was part of budget advocacy, and now is engaged at the national. So, um, and she became a leader mm -hmm. that we could point mm -hmm. out, and you can see in this. Mm -hmm. And those are the kind of leaders that we want in these yeah. communities, yeah. yeah. And that's, that's a very good approach. I mean, first of all, as you said, the health uh, uh, sector is, of course, touching all kind of areas uh, of, of daily life. and. Uh, uh, but also that you uh, support them in a very active way. It's not enough to just to say, okay, we have like five women in every workshop, uh, but you really support them in an active way. And from what I understand, this is not only true when it comes to gender, but you also work like this in a general way. You told me when you work with the youth leaders, you had young leaders already there in Uganda, but some of them were not so much capable of doing the decision making and you supported them in that way as well. Yes. Um Leadership entails more than having a title. Mm -hmm. Participation and, and creating change requires more than saying, I attended a workshop. You need to know that when, I, when, when we send a young person and a leader or the type of leader goes to a meeting and contributes and affects change, they understand the issues that, uh, that um, touch in the different sectors that we're working with. They understand the issue. They know that when I go to the district and there's a need, I want to, uh, they, my water source in our community broke down. They know that that's the water officer. Mm -hmm. So they can approach that water officer directly and demand for change. They know that if uh, they need agricultural inputs for their gardens, this is the um, agricultural officer. Mm -hmm. So those integrations and those yeah. types of leaders who n not only say, I'm a leader, but live an exemplary life mm -hmm. that that has a, 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 an impact and the other young people can see that and try to emulate yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. And this is very nice because I think the video itself is another example of empowerment because as you can see, Shivan, she's doing, she's the video reporter and they have done this very special video blogs like doing a journey and, and following four, I think four, four young people over the time and one of them was Fatuma. And as you can see in the video, it's done in a very uh, nice and direct way, maybe completely different as a, like a commercial agency would have done a, a video. So that's also very nice. I think it's an example in itself and you may, may maybe uh, at a media as a sector to you, as a fourth sector to you. Yes, approach. yeah. <laughs> media and governance for young exactly. people, yeah. yes. But of course, as we all know, it's not all roses. There are also obstacles, especially when it comes to multi stakeholder approaches. I mean, so many people working together, it's very complex. Leona, maybe you could tell us out of your findings, uh, also from, from other examples, what are the main problems they, they have to deal with? Yeah, so I think one of the key issues is always in basically any partnership, also if it's not necessarily the development context that a lot of partnerships start out with, well, a common goal, although that's sometimes also difficult to find, as Suzanne already uh, <laughs> touched upon. Um, but then, of course, how people get to that goal and what sort of understanding they have of that is oftentimes completely different. So. First of all, establishing this sort of common logic on how to get somewhere, I think, is extremely um, is oftentimes extremely difficult. Um, another aspect that I think or that I see a lot in my work is that different actors involved have different understandings in terms of how um, basically how fast things should go. So different understandings of time logics, and that's also something mm -hmm. that is very can be very difficult in, in multi-stakeholder uh, partnerships. Yeah. And then finally, also this, this lack of a, a truly bottom-up approach. I think it's um, not a given that even though a lot of partnerships have the ambition to involve um, different stakeholders continuously, that's also oftentimes pretty challenging because involving a lot of different people then again it creates efficiency problems so we have this sort of paradoxical situation there mm -hmm. that is uh, that is very tricky so there's a lot of let's say collaborative challenges uh, that often come back and that need um, in my opinion some reflection before mm -hmm. um, as Suzanne also already mentioned so really thinking of these steps before mm -hmm. or in the first phases of initiating a partnership and then also really a strong 
strong coordinative person or even unit that that sort of watches out for these for mm -hmm. these problems or challenges. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also be very familiar with the local context. And That's of course, context. yeah, especially in, in partnerships like TeamUp that have this clear aim of, of community engagement and capacity building. That's of course key to, um, mm -hmm. to have that in place, yeah. yeah, in my opinion, yeah. definitely. Susanna, I think you also have a lot uh, <laughs> to contribute when it comes to what challenges, what obstacles are there for the partnerships and with those people that you're um, trying to support, what are their uh, main problems? We've mentioned some of the things that are important already. And so, of course, sort of the flip side of that coin is if those things aren't going so well or haven't been set up so clearly or in a suitable way, mm -hmm. then that will probably lead to challenges. Mm -hmm. um, things like having common goals, having trust, having transparency, having communication and governance structures in place. Um, all of that definitely matters. We mentioned resilience earlier. Partnerships always encourage, uh, um, uh, find that circumstances change mm -hmm. compared to the plans they made a few years ago. So they will need to adapt. Um, and how they manage to do that is another important yeah. way to overcome challenges. And how, how often do you think does that happen, that people just go for this multi-stakeholder approach because it might be something which is now in the air and everybody talks about it without having done a proper analysis or uh, you know, a proper setup beforehand? It does happen, but I think increasingly people do realize a, they don't need to work with others if they can do it alone. Like your quote at the beginning said, it might be faster to just mm -hmm. go it alone. And that if you want to cooperate with others, it takes time, it takes effort. You have to set it up well. Mm -hmm. So you also have to weigh up the options and decide deliberately and consciously whether to set up a multi-stakeholder yeah. partnership for a particular purpose or not. But again, do you think there is a certain risk that Sometimes in, in development cooperation, we always have those buzzwords. And then for five years, we, we're running after this. And five years later, we're running after something else, another trend. And maybe multi-stakeholder approach is just another trend. And people are tempted to do it with, even if there is no need for it. I doubt it because it's expensive and it takes time. So I don't think it's a buzz in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, and you do it when it's not worth it. I do think cooperation is essential if we want to make the world a better place if you want to put it sort of very wishy-washy yeah. or maybe a bit more uh, concretely if, if we want to have a chance to reach the SDGs by 2030 we do need to get much better at, co at cooperating more and more effectively. Mm -hmm. Monica what from from your experience more on the ground which which were the main obstacles and challenges that Team Up Uganda was or still is facing? Um, as you said it takes time to develop partnerships. So um, the time and the commitment to collaboration needs work. And most times, and, sh and you talked about the time, you know, if you have mu multiple uh, partners that want to effect a partnership, but at different levels, you have to give them the time and the autonomy to get to where you are. And um, um, I remember that when we were starting out, we did have to clearly set up the parameters of what was, um, what, what was, specific to a particular partner where they executed their, 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 their activities on their own and where the synergies and those intersections and the partnerships were very valuable for us. And once we identified them, because now that's the commitment to the collaboration that we're talking about, how do you coordinate to make sure that that commitment is put into effect? So uh, um, that those, those commitments to collaboration, trying to make sure that there's a coordination and then the, first of all, the, the, the the always the constant evaluation, the constant learning, that's also very important. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, um, those partnerships take time, but the value and the impact that comes later, I feel is more sustainable and also uh, um, um, replicable once you know the lessons and you know the different things like trust between the partners, like how do you do something like financial management within the partners, what's acceptable, what is not, what's your codes of conduct, what are your values, you know, so that's really important. But the challenges mm -hmm. were there. Mm -hmm. It's not all rosy. Uh, um, we did, I, I remember that uh, um, we had, uh, 
an issue of uh, um, we set up these uh, very nice latrines, but uh, mm -hmm. in that context, you know, you had uh, the latrines for young people, for young girls, but the boys did not have. So we, we did have a few lessons learned. So, so what was, was, was the problem then? The boys were using the nice latrines, which yes. we were supposed yes. to use by the girls. <laughs> yes, yeah. So, so and, and those are learnings, and it's okay. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, um, in order for partnerships, to work, you also have to allow that there will be some failures, you know? Mm. Uh, and what do you do when you have those failures? You learn from them and you do it better the next time. That's already a nice yeah. lesson learned. Is there, from a very practical point of view, because now you're entering with Team Up Uganda, you're entering into a second phase. So what do you, do you have another very important lesson learned or still still a challenge to be o to, uh, which has to be overcome in the future now with you trying to also expand maybe the approach um i think the lesson learned is that uh, we need to make ourselves dispensable so that um, the young people can take charge of their communities, mm -hmm. yes. Um, the lesson learned is that when you empower young people within these communities and give them the power to effect change, maybe will become um, a non-issue in, the, in these mm -hmm. societies and communities. Mm -hmm. And isn't that what we're trying to mm -hmm. uh, move towards, yeah. But is there anything what you would say also from, from, from the project uh, side that you would do, that you are going to do different now in the second phase uh, compared to the first phase? Um, we are going, we're not um, going to construct the latrines because it's very time, it's very uh, uh, um, money, you know, it takes a lot of investment, but we are going to try to get the district to um, use the technology that we had worked on to then try to do this, to do something that's more cost effective on a wider scale, so that they are, they are providing some of these latrines mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, that, that they can afford within the, the schools, because this was something that was there. Yeah. Then also, uh, one of the things that uh, we want to do, a lesson learned was that we also need to engage at the policy level, mm -hmm. so that uh, a lot of the, um, Yes, we, we're talking about field, we're talking about district, but also to come in at the national. And now we're working on the national coordination mechanism where we want to draw in more CSOs because there's a lot of work and there are more partnerships that we can grow within mm -hmm. the community. Yeah. And it will become even more complex, but you, you yes. learn to deal with that. Yes. <laughs> and I, learned, I heard when you said you hand over, maybe handing over some task to the district instead districts, of doing yeah. it yourself, mm -hmm. it, it could also be a lesson learned for the future. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, uh, you do have a success because uh, you told me that uh, uh, there, is, uh, there is a national youth coordination mechanism in place right now. And uh, that means the Ministry of, uh, of Gender in Uganda wants to replicate what Team Up Uganda is doing. That's a big success for you. That, that is a very big success. Um, and we've already started developing meeting, uh, meetings and trying to see uh, nationally how are other is uh, how are other CSOs um, empowered and their capacity developed to understand the importance and the impact out of uh, mm -hmm. partnerships, but also how do they operationalize something that starts from the grassroots to the national level, the coordination of it all, mm -hmm. of all youth-focused organizations, but uh, creating those synergies that are so important. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's not yet the, mal the the massive success, but it's a work in progress, and we hope that if well executed, because mm -hmm. that's the important thing. The plans, you know, are always fantastic, but the goal is to make sure that you actually put mm -hmm. it into, into action, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's, that's uh, I think that's already a very good um, conclusion. Uh, we know, of course, that uh, multi-stakeholder partnerships are not the miracle cure for each and every case, but if, uh, coming almost also to the end of our debate, uh, if they are supposed to be also sustainable. The question is how to make them sustainable. And I would like each one of you coming to the end of our discussion already to finish uh, one sentence for me, um, saying um, multi-stakeholder partnerships are or can be sustainable if who wants to start? <laughs> you want to start? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say they can be sustainable if they are really organized in a very democratic manner and um, if they have really well thought through and proper uh, internal evaluation mechanisms in place. So that would be my main takeaway, basically. Thank you. 
Now, Susanna, you have a challenge yourself because I think you very much agree, but you have to come up with something <laughs> in addition to that. <laughs> I think I can. I think multi-stakeholder partnerships should be sustained until they have reached their goals. Okay, and when they have reached their goals, we just leave them alone. They might not be needed anymore in that particular case, right? Because it's a means to an end and not an end in itself to have such a partnership. Mm -hmm. So, Monica, the final word on this goes to you. What do you think, or what is maybe also to your wish to those people you're working with, those uh, three foundations, in order to make the Team Up Uganda uh, a really sustainable yeah. approach in the long run? Um, I think I'll start as well. Multi sector, uh, multi -sector partnerships uh, will be more successful if we use them to strengthen the systems and the structures that are already in the communities. And if they're not there to build them so that they are engaged in, within the community and they're controlled and the different decisions are made by young people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the goal is to make ourselves not needed. That's a very nice one. And I think there is not much more to add on this. Maybe only uh, one, one thing we did not reveal. Uh, what is a big advantage of you uh, working together with three foundations? You told me in the beginning, you only have to do one report, <laughs> not three for yes. each and every one. That's <laughs> also a really yes. big advantage. It is but of course, advantage. the other ones for yeah. the people on the ground are yes. much more important. Okay. And having said that, yeah, I would like to thank, thank you all also to our audience here who made it to Hamburg and hopefully all of you behind the screen, you also enjoyed the discussion as much as we did, at least as I did. It was very fruitful and nice discussion and I think we learned a lot from each other. We're still learning and yeah, when you go home, maybe just um, try to work on your partnerships, <laughs> on your networks, no matter how many people are involved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.